uh, tonight of the Word of God. Amen. Brother Cheryl, would you come? Amen. Somebody say, God bless Brother Cheryl. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord, everybody. Amen. Thank God for what we are feeling in this in this service tonight. Amen. Isn't God great? Thank you, Jesus. I'm glad I came to church tonight. Amen. To experience the Lord and feel his touch, his presence among us. Thank you, Brother Stewart, for uh, allowing us to be with you with you in this great church give honor to you and um, to your family all the guests that are here tonight there's the call names I'm going to miss people I know but we got enough preachers here my word I could give everybody five minutes and we'd be here a couple of hours amen but uh, all the ministers that are here I honor you tonight and all of our guests and home folk. Amen. I want to take your attention to the book of Acts chapter 12. Verse number going to read down several verses here, which is breaking custom for me a little bit. I try to keep text short and sweet for the most part. Um, we're going to read a few verses here, starting with verse number one of Acts chapter 12. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church to kill James, the brother of John, with the sword, because he saw it pleased the Jews. He proceeded further to take Peter also. Then were the days of unleavened bread, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison and delivered him to four quaternions of soldiers to keep him, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Peter, therefore, was kept in prison, but prayer was made without ceasing of the church unto God for him. And when Herod would have brought him forth the same night, Peter was sleeping between two soldiers bound with two chains, and the keepers before the door kept the prison. And behold, the angel of the Lord came upon him, and the light shined in the prison, and he smote Peter on the side and raised him up, saying, Arise up quickly, and his chains fell off from his hands." The angel said unto him, Gird thyself and bind on thy sandals. And so he did. And he said unto him, Cast thy garment about thee and follow me. And he went out and followed him and wist not that it was true, which was done by the angel, but thought he saw vision. Verse 10. When they were past the first and the second ward, they came into the iron gate that leadeth into the city, which opened to them of his own accord. And they went out and passed on through one street and forwith the angel departed from him and when Peter was come to himself he said now I know of a surety that the Lord hath sent his angel and delivered me out of the hand of Herod from all the expectation of the people of the Jews and we're going to stop there with verse number 11 let's go to the Lord in prayer and ask God to help us in the remainder of this service tonight let's pray together Jesus we come humbly to you once again, and we thank you for the witness of the Holy Ghost, God, that we have already felt and experienced in this place. And I pray, God, that you would help me, help me to deliver your word in an effective way to your people, to minister to those that are here. Confirm your word, Jesus, I pray tonight with signs following, and we'll give you thanks and we we'll give you praise for it. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ, we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Thank you for standing. Brother Shockley, I do want to give you honor tonight, Bishop of this church. In 
In Acts chapter 12, we find here, starting with this beginning, verse number one, that the Bible said, Herod stretched forth his hands to vex, vex certain of the church. Anybody ever felt like you've been vexed before? Vexed of the church. You know, vexed is um, is something that the devil tries to do to everybody. Vex you. Vex is basically putting things on you, loading you with unnecessary stuff to vex you. And if the devil can't get in you, the next best thing for him is to get on you and to vex you. To vex your spirit, to vex your mind, to vex your body, vex your family, to vex you. And this is what Herod started doing. This was his beginning point. He stretched forth his hands or his authority and he began to vex certain of the church. Vexing them by commentary say, fining them, imposing fines upon them, spoiling their goods, imprisoning them. And then evidently it pleased him to vex the church. And he saw that it was pleasure to him, I guess. And then he was able to go and to take James, the brother of John, and to take his life. And then things just start escalating and he is reaching his hand and stretching it as far as he can. I mean, he is finding them and then he tries to stretch it further vexing them and then he tries to spoil their goods and then he stretches it further he's imprisoning them and then that doesn't satisfy him and he tries to stretch it further and he takes John or James pardon me and he's stretching his hand one thing I found out about the devil is that the devil will take from you as much as you allow him to. And if you let his hand just keep on working into your life, he'll keep stretching into your life. And he'll stretch it until you say, that's enough. You're not going any further than that. You're not going to stretch it any further into my life. It's not going to happen. I have found out that, you know, some people may say, well, you know, the devil wants to take that. Well, that ain't worth the fight. So I'm just going to, instead of fighting him over that insignificant, minute thing that he's taking from me, I'm just going to let him have that because it ain't worth the trouble. Well, the problem with that is if you let him have that insignificant thing, he's going to stretch his hand a little further. He's going to try you with something else. And if you allow him to take that, well, that's not going to satisfy him. And he's going to reach his hand further than that. The, uh, The moral we could all learn here is, you know, you're going to have to fight somewhere. You're going to either have to fight the devil over the insignificant 
Or if you let him go with the insignificant, he will reach until it, he puts his hand on something significant. And if you wait to fight the devil over something significant, you know, perhaps before it got to that, if I would have fought him when it was insignificant, I wouldn't be having the significant battle in my life. There's going to have to be a line somewhere. And there's going to be confrontation somewhere with the devil. And there's going to be conflict somewhere with the devil. And, and I, would, I would rather fight the devil over something that somebody may think is small and insignificant and minute and, and push him back from that vantage point than to wait until he tries to get something significant from me and things are turned upside down and chaos ensues into my life and things become out of control, I would rather say, you're not getting anything from me and I'm going to fight you from step number one instead of fighting from step number 10. Amen. Somebody shout praise God. The Bible says, this is just me. If your theology is different, then that's you. But this is just my vantage point. The Bible tells us that we have power to cast out devils. To cast out devils. It didn't tell us that we had to wait till the devil got to a certain point to cast them out. He just said we have the power to cast out devils. Amen. I would rather cast the devil out when he turned into my neighborhood than to wait to cast him out after he stepped across the threshold into my house. Amen. When I see the devil step into my neighborhood, I would rather tell the devil then, I'm casting you out of here now. I'm not going to wait till there's chaos and there's trouble and things are upside down to cast the devil out. I say I want to stop the devil in his tracks right now and tell the devil it's time to turn around. It's time to go the other direction. Hallelujah. Somebody shout praise God. I believe we have the power to cast out devils. Amen. I want to talk to you tonight. My subject is stopping Satan in his tracks. Amen. And I think by the power of the Holy Ghost, we have the ability to tell the devil, you have taken one too many steps. You have reached just a little too far. And you have gone over the lines of demarcation by the power of the name of Jesus. Jesus, I come to stop the devil in his tracks and say no more. You've come too far. It's time to turn around. Hallelujah. Would anybody agree with me tonight that it's time to tell the devil, you come too far into my mind. You come too far into my body. You come too far into my family. You come too far into this church. I'm here to tell the devil, we come to stop you in your tracks. In the name of Jesus Christ. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord today. <laughs> Satan can, through Herod, he can stretch his hand as far as he wants to. But when his hand meets a man that has a promise from the Lord on his life, it's time to let the devil know that's as far as you can go. Because God has gave me a promise. And your hand is not going to be able to override the promise of God in my life. God has put a, a prophecy and a promise upon me. And I don't care how far you reach your hand, this is where it stops. Amen. 
God has promised me. And the Lord had promised Simon Peter back in John 21. He spoke to Simon Peter and he said, Simon Peter, verily, verily, I say unto you, when thou was young, you girded yourself and you walkest whither thou wouldest. But when thou shalt be old, thou shalt stretch forth thine hands. In other words, your hands are going to be stretched out. And he's telling him, you're going to be crucified. And he said, and another shall gird thee and carry you where thou wouldest not. Amen. So Simon Peter is here in Herod's jail cell and he clothes himself that morning and he tied his own shoes and he's not old. And he said, you know what? I got a promise on me and it's going to stop the devil in his tracks. And in Herod's jail cell, Simon went to sleep with a promise of God upon his life. Hallelujah. Seemingly, seemingly, this is amazing to me that Simon Peter doesn't have a care in the world. All that Herod had been doing against the people of God. And Simon Peter says, but it stops with me. And he had apprehended him and put him in prison. Chained him up. Between two soldiers. Intending to kill him. And made that public. Simon Peter said, Well, he don't know it, but I know it. He couldn't kill me with an atomic bomb. Because the Lord done told me how I was going to die. So I'm going to sleep. God can put us in the eye of the storm. When everything around you is going chaotic. The Lord can put you in the very eye and the calm of the storm. While Herod was uneasy in his palace, the soldiers was on their guard. The outsiders were getting ready for another execution and no small stir. The disciples are in a prayer meeting. Angels are on errands of deliverance. And it seems the whole exterior world is disturbed and busy of the, of the task at hand. But Simon Peter is in the middle of the storm, in the eye of the storm. And in Herod's jail cell, he kicks his shoes off uh, and he takes his coat off. Uh, angels are busy. Disciples are busy. The soldiers are on their guard. Uh, Herod is uneasy. And everything is disturbed uh, with their attention uh, on Simon Peter. But Simon Peter kicked his shoes off uh, and he took his coat off. Uh, and he said, I think I'm going to go to sleep uh, because God uh, is going to stop Satan in his tracks. Hallelujah. I want to preach to somebody on this Friday night and no one, the devil is telling you, well, look at what I have done. Look at my history. Look at what I've already happened. And the same thing is going to happen to you. I come to tell you the devil is a liar. God sent me to tell you he's going to stop the devil in his tracks. Well, look what I did to them. Look what I did to them. It's going to happen to you too. I say the devil is a liar. I got a promise of God. I got the hand of God up on my life. And it's going to stop Satan in his tracks. Yes. Hallelujah. Man, I tell you, I got a lot to say and I may not get there. Amen. But, you know, Brother, Brother Stewart, I look at this and see Simon Peter in this jail chained between two soldiers. Other soldiers are standing at guard at the doors. and I mean, he is 
guarded about as good as you can be guarded. If there's one person that Herod doesn't want to escape, it's Simon Peter. It seems to me I could be wrong, but when you read the words of the scripture, the Bible said he's chained with two chains between two soldiers. It seems to me that it's very possible not only does Simon Peter have chains on him, but his chains are chained to guards. He's not just chained to the wall, he's chained to guards. I mean, if he scratches his nose, it's going to put everybody on alert. Herod doesn't want Simon Peter escaping that prison cell. Lord, if the guards were outside the door, maybe we could tunnel him out. If it was a different scenario, maybe there's a way, but the way... Herod's got this thing situated. I just don't know how you're going to do this one. It's amazing to me that the things we view as, okay, God, this one. I don't know how you're going to do this one. I mean, I've seen you do other ones before, but this one. You're going to have to really figure something out with this one. I mean, he's in an inner cell. There's guards at the gates. But in the prison, in this very cell, there's guards. And he's chained to them. I don't know how you're going to get him out of this one. Have you ever looked at a situation perhaps in your own life and you thought, God, I know you can, but I just don't know how you're going to do it. not saying you can't, but I just don't see a way. And in our own carnal minds, we think if if you get this done, you're going to have to roll up your sleeves on this one because this is a tough one. I mean, they they obviously thought it was tough. They having an all-night prayer meeting. But I I want you to see the ease in which God works in our toughest dilemmas. I mean, he just called an angel and he said, take care of that. And the angel goes down. He doesn't get a, he doesn't go and visit in hours. He doesn't get a pass from Herod for visitation. He don't go in like Bruce Lee karate chopping doors down and knocking people out like Mike Tyson. He don't, he don't, he don't light no dynamite and blow the place up. I'm talking about Simon Peter is asleep between those two soldiers and the Bible said the angel just went in. I mean, he didn't get nobody's permission. He didn't ask anybody if he could. He just went in. And the Bible said, and the light shined in the prison. Have the light get in. Brother, God don't need nobody's permission to get in. Amen. God don't need to ask Herod. He don't need to ask the guards. He don't need to ask the soldiers. He just steps in with ease and effortly. An angel came and a light shone in a prison. And he said, hey, pal, all you got to do is get up. I'm going to be at the door. But if you just get up and follow me, everything is going to be all right. And Simon Peter got up, tied his shoes, put his coat on, and he said, follow me. And he went to the door, and it was like a Winn-Dixie door. It just opened up to its own accord, a slide door and they just walk right through it walk right through the next one and walk right through the next one there was no lightsabers there was no knocking the doors down there was no dynamite it was effortless it was with ease it was with no strain it was with no sweat I don't know how how hard you think your dilemma is, but when God gets ready to do it, it's going to be with ease. It's going to be effortless. It's going to be without sweat. Somebody clap your hands to the Lord here today. 
I don't care if the doctor said, I don't know how God can heal without, without any sweat. I don't know how it's going to work out. When you get God involved, it's without effort. It's with ease. Hallelujah. That's how God works. Amen. That's why I told one man he had great faith. And the man said, I got a servant lying homesick. Jesus said, I'll come. And the man said, Lord, this is easy for you. You ain't got to come, Lord. All you got to do just right there, all you got to do just speak the word. Because anything you do, you don't have to get up and put forth no effort. All you got to do is speak the word and it's done. Because you do things with ease. If it's a solar system with billions of stars light years away, you don't even spend any time on it. The Bible just said he made them too. He made them also. When God gets ready to move, he don't have to, he don't have to conjure up any extra power. He just speaks. He just works. And he just does it without effort and with ease. Hallelujah. not a struggle it's not a struggle for God to do it somebody shout amen Amen. I feel the Holy Ghost right there I said it's not a struggle for God to do it it ain't a struggle for God to heal it ain't a struggle for God to deliver it ain't a struggle for God to save he does it with ease (laughs) Bible said the Bible said, Brother Kay, that it's no restraint to the Lord to deliver by many or by few. In other words, it makes no difference to God. He can do it either way. He can do it with 32,000 or he can do it with 300 or he can do it with one. Or if the one bails out, he can do it with a rooster. It don't matter to God. He can do it any way he wants to. The reason we struggle with that it's because that's not our DNA. That's not our human makeup. God has no level of difficulty, Brother Stewart. We do. We have level of difficulty. Give me that Kleenex, Brother Cheryl. I'll give it to you. That's low level of difficulty. Brother Cheryl, can you move that monitor over here? Yeah, can. But I'm going to have to take my coat off and roll my sleeves up probably. Well, if I don't do that, you're going to hear me grunt a little bit. I can promise you that. The point is, from that to that, it's a big discrepancy of level of difficulty. But with God, God has no levels of difficulty. It's no restraint to the Lord. He don't try any harder to move the Kleenex box as he would to move the monitor. It's no restraint to the Lord if he delivered by 32,000 or if he delivered by 300. It's no restraint to the Lord. It doesn't matter to God. He don't have to try any harder to heal cancer than he does to heal a headache. It's no harder for God to do it. If Simon Peter is in a jail cell chained between two soldiers or if he's somewhere and his goods are just spoiled. It's no harder for God. He does it with ease. He does it without effort. And there's somebody here tonight. God is going to blow your mind of what he's going to do. You thought it was hard, but nothing is too hard for God. Anybody believe that tonight? I said nothing. It's too hard for God. It ain't too hard. It ain't too hard. There's no level of difficulty. He's still a healer. He's still a deliverer. He's still a redeemer. He's still a savior. He can still stop the devil in his tracks. Hallelujah. Let's lift our hands up to the Lord together here today. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah. 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 Thank you, Jesus. 
Let's all stand and lift our hands to the Lord here. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. In the name of Jesus. Reach over and lay your hand on somebody close beside you if it's comfortable. Would you do that? God, I want you to move with ease right now. I want you to touch them without effort, God. It's a big miracle, but it's effortless. It's with ease. It's without struggle. It's without strain. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. God don't have to try any harder to fill you with the Holy Ghost. He don't have to try any harder to forgive your sin. He don't have to try any harder to deliver you or to heal you or to set you free. He does it with ease. He does it with ease. The Bible said, musicians come if you will. The Bible said, <laughs> that night the Bible said Herod would have brought him forth that same night he would have but the Lord had stopped him I want to go another step I want to reach my hand a little further but even though I got plans and I got ambitions and I've got desires, this is as far as I can go. Something has stopped me right in my tracks. Yes. And I feel like the Lord wants somebody here to know, and I've said it already and I know I'm like a broke record, but the Lord's wanting somebody to know the Lord is able. And in this house tonight, he wants and desires to tell the devil and to stop him in his tracks. And say, was you working and you thought you had momentum and you thought you had this thing wrapped up and you thought you was doing everything you wanted to do. But when you got here and when you got to this point and when you got to this juncture, all of a sudden, God stepped in. And God said, this is where it stops. Right? This is where it stops. The Lord got a history of stopping the enemy in his tracks. He went to the city called Nain, and he's going in, the, in that little city called Nain. But out of that same gate that he was going into, there's a funeral coming out. And Jesus stopped that funeral on his tracks. And he said, open that casket. And they opened the casket. And he spoke to that dead boy in that casket. And he said, get up. And that dead boy got up. And he delivered him to his mother. And that funeral turned around and went right back the same direction it came. The Lord stops the devil in his tracks. He stopped death in his tracks. Amen. He went to Legion to Gadara, and he was trying to kill him, and he stopped Legion in his tracks. He stopped sin in his tracks at the woman they threw at his feet, and he said, where are thine accusers? Go and sin no more. Amen. He stopped disease in his tracks. Hallelujah. He stopped palsy in his tracks. He stopped fear and anxiety in his tracks, and if he did it then, he wants to do the same thing on a Friday night. He wants to to stop the adversary in his tracks tonight. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. The Bible said, and I'm closing here. The Bible said, Lamentations 3 and 22, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. 
It's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. When I read that verse, every time I read that verse, I think of Exodus chapter 3. When Moses was at the mountain of God on the backside of the desert and he turned around and he saw a bush. And that bush was on fire. But the Bible said, but it was not consumed. Should have been. That bush should have got burned up like every other bush in the desert that had been burned up by the scorching heat and the sun. But for some reason, the same fire that would burn up any other bush was on a bush that was tender just like every other bush. But what should have happened wasn't happening. Lord spoke out to Moses. First Moses said he spoke to me out of the fire. Then later he said he spoke to me out of the bush. I'm trying to find out where's the voice coming from. Is the voice coming from the fire or is the voice coming from the bush? I think he was so far in that fire and bush. Moses couldn't really discern where that theophany, where that manifestation was coming from. But somehow God had got between the fire and the bush. And that's where he heard the voice coming from. And the fire should have been burning the bush, but it wasn't consumed because the Lord was right in the middle of the fire in the bush. That's why Lamentation said, it's of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed. The same fire got on me that destroyed a lot of people. But I'm here tonight because God got between the bush and the fire. What should have consumed me did not consume me. And the Lord stopped the devil and Satan in his tracks. Hallelujah. Yeah. 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 The things that the devil says, it consumed them, it consumed them, it consumed them, it messed them up, it messed them up, it got them, it got them, it got them, and it's going to get you. But the Lord's here tonight saying, but it don't have to get you. Because I'm going to get between the fire and the bush. It's going to look like it should consume you. It's going to look like it should burn you up. It's going to look like it should do you in and take you down. And everybody's going to wonder, how did you escape that fire? It got everybody else. With the way I escaped it, it's because the Lord said, you're going to get awful close. But I'm going to stop you right there. And you're not going to consume them. You're not going to take them out. You're not going to do them in. I'm going to stop the enemy in his tracks. Hallelujah. I got more I could say. One more time, let's lift our hands up to the Lord here today. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Jesus. Hallelujah to the Lamb of God. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. I wonder if there's anybody here as they about to sing here in just a moment. If there's anybody here that would just like to send the devil a message, it doesn't matter if it's a child, a teenager, adult, whomever you are. If you feel like God may be speaking to you tonight and you want to send a message to the devil and say, you may have reached your hand thus far, but I'm telling you, this is where you stop. God's going to stop you in your tracks right here on a Friday night. God's going to bring uh, your plans and your works uh, to a screeching halt. Uh, and it's going to say, this is where it ends. Uh, this is where it's done. Uh, and this is where it's finished. I believe God can finish anxiety. And he can finish disease. Uh, and he can finish sickness. Uh, and he can finish things uh, that have been trying to consume you. And the Lord can stop it in its tracks. I'm going to make a simple appeal. If there's anybody here, the devil's tried to tell you, this is it. It's going to consume you. It's going to take you down. I'm, I'm, it, it, this is what it did here. This is, what it, this is the history of this fire. And now it's on you. And you're going to get the same results everybody else got that dealt with this same fire. And if the devil's trying to lie to you and try to dictate your future, but God is saying, even though Herod would bring you out and he would do to you what, Herod, what he's done to others, I say it ain't going to happen to you.
I say I'm going to stop the devil in his tracks right now. Don't use past references of what's going to happen in your future. The devil is a liar, and he is the father of it. God is here to stop him in his tracks tonight. If you feel like God is talking to you, and you want to respond not just to the preacher, but you want to respond to the word of God and to the spirit of the Lord, and you want to slip out of your seat and just make your way to this altar and lift your hand, you can fill in the blank of whatever it is, but you can say, God, I believe you're going to stop it in its tracks tonight. In the name of Jesus Christ, if you feel like God is talking to you in some fashion or form, I'm inviting you, come on, slip out of your pew, make your way down to this altar and lift your hands up to God and say, Lord, I'm putting my faith in you now. I'm putting my trust in you now. I'm putting my confidence in you, Jesus. The devil's saying this is going to happen and something else is going to happen. But I say that the fire, it's not going to consume me. I say the Lord's going to stop the devil in his tracks. I say he's going to bring his plans to a screeching halt. For this reason was the Son of Man manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift up our hands to the Lord together here. I love you, Jesus. Oh, mighty God, I lift you up. God, I magnify your name. Hallelujah. Come on, let's lift up our voice to the Lord. In the name of Jesus Christ. Let's lift up our hand. We're going to lay hands on you tonight. And we're going to pray in the name of Jesus. That the power of the Holy Ghost is going to bring the devil's plans to a screeching halt. In the name of Jesus. We're going to praise my Jesus till the walls fall down. I know he's reaching beyond my prayer. 